Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here on a beautiful early September Sunday here on Labor Day weekend. Uh, announcements are in the bulletin. Uh, the session meeting uh, on um, Wednesday night, the choir practice we think now might be at 6.30. Paul kind of updated that from what he knew. So at 6.30, if you show up at 7, I'm sure they'd still take you in the choir. What, what's that? I said, and all are welcome to come to the choir practice. Does that mean if I showed up, I could get to sing in the choir? It would ruin the choir. Yes, you no. can. <laughs> yes. I can hum. I hear singers out there. Don't think I don't hear you. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on it. Um, next Sunday is our pet service. I hope you bring your pets. I don't know if Francis is here, but last year he brought his horse. I hope he'll uh, consider doing that again. That was great. And um, let me see. Sunday school starting in two weeks, so please help spread the word on that. Now, are there other people with announcements we should be making? Yes. Dave. Oh, oh. Wait a minute. Wait. We have, to, we have to announce this in the microphone, otherwise it doesn't count. Hold on. <laughs> I said, today is Karen's birthday. Okay. I'm celebrating the 42nd anniversary of my 29th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I was never good at math, but that's very impressive, I think. That. <laughs> All right. Any other birthdays? Or Lynn has an announcement for us, probably. Go, go, to, the, go to the mic. There you go. I have a birthday and an announcement. Okay. Um, my oldest turned 21 this past week. Wow. And um, Sunday school, uh, just wanted to remind everybody that that starts in two weeks. And for students in grades K through 6, we will have programming for them during service and working on putting something together for students in grades 7 through 12. Hopefully, they'll be meeting maybe once a month. Um, at this point, if you are somebody who would be willing to help with either some behind the scenes planning, if you are interested in working with the younger students, if you are interested in helping out with the older students, middle school, high school kids, um, if you could please be in touch because I have some jobs that I would love some help with and they can be small but they could be large depending on what you have time for and what you're able to do. Could be as often as every week, could be as often as once a month. Let me know, please. Thank you. Thank you. Did you give us the, uh, did you give us the birthday announcement? Oh, Andrew. Andrew's birthday. Yeah. So we have Andrew and Karen. Anyone else with, yes, Cheryl. Cheryl. So it's um, still not too late to sign up for 100 Days of Dante. We now have seven dedicated readers in our little small community. Um, we've only done two. It's 100 Days of Dante. Oh, somebody's saying what? Oh, so it's an online reading group. Um, oh, it's an online reading group uh, sponsored by um, Baylor um, Honors College, Baylor University, the Honors College there. Um, we've only done two cantos in the Inferno so far. First one was a little introduction about what to be ex what's to be expected along our journey. And the second one was really cool. Um, Dante, the pilgrim, is getting cold feet. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to go down there. <laughs> and his guide, and his guide Virgil, is a spirit, or Dante calls him a shade, and he's encouraging him, come on, man, come on, man up. And Dante is, is like, well, your spirit's not going to hurt you. So then Virgil takes another tact. He says, OK, let me tell you all these wonderful, blessed women that are on your side and are rooting for you. And he's got some really amazing um, cheerleaders. He's got the Virgin Mary. He's got St. Lucy. And he has. Beatrice, Be well, Beatrice, my Italian's bad. Beatrice, his, the blessed one. Anyway, they are rooting for him. And, and I got to thinking, who is rooting for me? 
or us. We all have cheerleaders, parents, teachers, um, friends. I've got a lot of, count of, of cheerleaders here. I won't embarrass all of you by pointing you out. <laughs> but, um, but um, oh, and I have some online. Hate on Iva, hate on Molly. Um, but anyway, so um, I just want to encourage you to sign up, read dot, join our reading group, read Dante. It's not hard. Um, and then once you sign up online, let me know either verbally or um, sign up on the sheet that I have out in the hallway because we'll get together during our journey. And I'm just going to close with something that Dr. Anthony Neusmeyer said about the second canto. He said, Dante, I quote, Dante's fictional epic stands as one of the greatest teachers of our non-fictional world. Ooh, so I hope that inspires you to sign up. 100daysofdante.com. So if Dante had cold feet about going into hell, that would probably take care of that. <laughs> Just <think> about <laughs> Not that I'm advocating that. I mean. oh, thank you. Are there other announcements? Yes, Betsy. Well, wait, hold on, Betsy. We have to get the... Yeah, sure you do. We want people far and wide to know about this. Hold on. Well, today, 60 years ago, my son Greg was born and actually was on Labor Day the day he was born, which was very appropriate. And he's not here, but I thought it would be nice to sing to him, too. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And somebody else had, oh, Ellen. Good morning. First, I want to say thank you to everyone who brought flowers in during the summer. It really just made uh, the worship together just that much more beautiful. I don't even know who brought these beautiful zinnias today. Louise. 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 Thank you, Louise. Um, and second, and you can see I'm appropriately <laughs> dressed, right? <clears throat> second is fall has started, so I'm going to put up a new uh, flower chart. And it's just going to do for the first four months um, up to December. People can sign up as individuals. Or uh, <coughs> three, I'm looking for maybe one or two people who are willing to uh, provide flowers three or four times during this four-month period. It just helps us in the planning. So this will be up on the bulletin board just outside the office. Or talk to me, I'm Ellen. And I won't always wear a flower, but I'm the flower lady. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, now who, who are we singing to here now? Karen and Andy. And Adam. 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 Okay, wait a minute. Okay. Sorry. I just have one quick announcement. Um, next week, my husband won't be here, but it'll, it's his birthday next week, and he's going to be 40. <laughs> yep, Kelly, he'll be in England, but he's going to turn 40 in England, so we won't be here. Okay. And you can keep the microphone as a souvenir. No, I guess not. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to sing, or we got more? Oh. John This past Thursday? We need to sing to Dot, too. Okay. We got a whole bunch of people who are singing to you. Ready? Okay, here we go. I'm going to share a quick letter that we got this week uh, with everyone. Uh, it's written to me, but it's for the whole church, I think. Um, uh, you won't remember me, but we met recently at Cheryl Dankhouse's party. I'm Cheryl's cousin. This gentleman's name is John Landrigan. Uh, 
After the party, Cheryl had occasion to share the August 21st edition of your church newsletter, and I read with interest your announcement of the news that the Community Church of New Boston had been included on the list of so-called woke churches in New Hampshire. My wife and I uh, admire and applaud your response to that, in token of which we would like to make the enclosed donation to your church. I hope your congregation agrees with you in your response to the woke list, but speaking as a native New Hampshireite, the idea that any community of Granite Staters would agree unanimously on, well, anything strikes me as unlikely. <laughs> so, if it does happen that any of your congregants express concern that your appearance on the list will somehow harm the church or reflect poorly on it, at least you can now reassure them that it has also produced an unlooked for donation. Naturally, the donation is to be used as you see fit, though if there's any opportunity to note it as being in honor of Cheryl and in memory of Charlie, that would be an additional pleasure for us. Good luck with your work, John Landrigan. So I share that with you, because you're a great group, yeah. and you're pretty woke. Okay, so let us begin the service with our morning prelude. We gather as disciples of Jesus of Nazareth to give thanks for his love, to ponder the direction we should take in accordance with his teaching, and to celebrate his great gift of life together. And let us begin to worship as we sing our opening hymn, which is number 401.
seated. Our, our unison reading is a reading from the 8th century BC, the, the words of Amos on the bulletin, uh, announcement side of your bulletin. So let us. Uh, uh, the context of this is that Amos has shown up at a big religious service, big festival uh, in the land of Israel, and um, he kind of puts a damper on things. So let us read together. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. with the words of the Apostles' Creed on the inside cover of our hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our New Testament uh, reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, don't know if he met Dante there, it doesn't say about that, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here uh, to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And here ends our 
reading. Well, I've been talking about heroes. Now, next week we won't probably have a children's sermon because we'll be outside with the, the dogs and the cats and the fish and maybe the horses and who knows who else might be there. But I'm talking about heroes. So in two weeks, when Sunday school starts, I want uh, kids, we'll have them come up. There'll be more kids here. And, and maybe they can tell a story of who their heroes are. So I'd be interested to hear that. So that would be something to think about. I'll try to put that in the newsletter, too. To, and kids uh, can deliver a children's sermon on why somebody that they think of as a hero is a hero. I want to talk about a friend of mine um, who I've, I've been very blessed to be in contact with the last couple of years. I hadn't talked to him for years and years and years. Uh, but he was my hero in school. His um, name was Bruce Corbridge. Still is Bruce Corbridge, as a matter of fact. Um, he lives now out in Oakland, California, where he's retired from being a banker uh, at a big company in Oakland. Not a banker, he was a lawyer for that company. Well, Bruce was the kind of kid that could do anything. Um, he was, first of all, a terrific athlete. Uh, in junior high school, he played on our junior high football team as a running back. He was very good. But in high school, he didn't play football because his dad was the tennis coach. And in New York State, we used to play the tennis season in the fall. So he became, um, as soon as he showed up on the court, the best tennis player uh, on our team. Uh, he was elected senior class president. He was He, he won a... Naval ROT scholarship to Yale, graduated from Yale, uh, and I guess uh, after college he went, he was in Vietnam in the Navy and he met his wife there, and came back married and then went to law school. He was just good at anything, anything. But you know why he's my hero? Not just was he good at anything, he was one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. I don't know, as kids, if there are kids in school who think they're better than everybody else because they're good at something. Uh, he was good at everything. Always dated the best-looking girls, you know. And, but everybody liked him because he was a nice guy. And he still is. And as I've been in contact with him the last couple of years, he sent us several contributions to the church here. Just a terrific guy. Made everybody feel good um, when he said hi to you. And... Um, so I'm very, very grateful for him, and I think um, it reminds me as kids go back to school, they just uh, going back again on Tuesday after a couple days starting out. Look for kids in school who might be new, or there might be the kids that everybody makes fun of, or there might be the kids that don't seem to know anybody or nobody talks to, and you be their hero. You go talk to them. You go invite them to join you in whatever game you're playing on the playground. Because that makes a lot of difference in, um, in the lives of, of those kids. And they may remember you as one of their heroes um, um, 60 or 70 years later. Uh, it's something to think about. Okay, that's our children's sermon for today. And Bruce Corbridge was our honoree. So please take a moment, say good morning to those around you, and we'll... Get to the sermon here. I haven't even told a bad joke yet, and Candy came up and said, wondered if she could move the candle so I wouldn't be cut in half. But then she... <laughs> But then she said, in my vision. So I guess it was OK. I... <laughs> you never know what's going to happen here. Well, you know, just the other day, I, I saw a fellow fishing off the bridge over here, which is pretty unusual these days. And the water is pretty low uh, in the river. So I went over, and I was just visiting with him a little bit. and. Uh, a, 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 just a couple fish went by, uh, kind of individually, but he never threw his line into the water. I said, how come you're not, if you're fishing, why aren't you throwing your line in the water at these fish? He says, I'm waiting for a big group. I said, why is that? He said, well, when fish are in schools, they sometimes take debate. So, now think about that. Okay, well, that's bad when you have to explain the jokes. Debate, debate, okay.
That was a double dipper or down. Okay. Well, in thinking about the meaning of Labor Day, I've been pondering this, and um, I just mentioned Bruce Corbridge, our senior class president. Uh, uh, last time we had a high school reunion, it must have been our 50th a couple of years ago, and um, we're almost up to the 60th, I think. Next year would be the 60th. Um, and there was a football game. You know, it's over the weekend in the fall. And uh, so we all went out to the football field um, to watch a Garden City High take on a school, and the school that was coming was from Brooklyn. And uh, they were late. And it was an all-black high school in Brooklyn. And uh, when it was announced they were late getting there, um, when they finally showed up, the word came they were on their way, escorted by the police. The bus reached the town line. The police escorted them to the football field. And one of our classmates said uh, a very perceptive line. He said, you know, this is the, probably the most black people entering our town um, uh, since uh, homeowners brought in their black maids on a Saturday morning. Uh, it was kind of a funny line, but then it wasn't funny. I mean, the town I grew up in was on Long Island. This was not Alabama or, uh, you know, uh, Georgia. Um, kind of sad to think about. Uh, fortunately, I think the town is finally integrated. I think I've told this story before, but uh, a lot of my friends and I were big sports fans in high school, and we were excited when we heard that Floyd Patterson, the heavyweight champion of the world, lived in Rockville Center, not far from Garden City. That's a town where uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin and Arnie Arneson grew up, if you know. Remember Arnie when she ran for governor? And um, so we were excited. You know, the heavyweight champion was going to move to our town. Then all of a sudden, uh, the Garden City News, a weekly paper, uh, reported that the house Floyd Patterson was looking at uh, had been purchased by the Garden City Property Owners Association. And we all wondered, what the heck was that? I would, we, we didn't know. Turned out, I later learned, that Jackie Robinson had the same thing happen to him. He looked at a house in Garden City. Of course, he played uh, for the Dodgers in Brooklyn. And uh, the Property Owners Association, whoever they were, bought that house. Well, now I can tell you that the property owners were certainly simply a group of racists who bought those houses because they didn't want any black people living in town. Fortunately, uh, that day is gone in Garden City. Um, now, Garden City is a great town. I don't want you to think that we had Ku Klux Klan's rallies or anything. I mean, we got a great education there. Um, a lot of folks went to Yale. Bruce was one of, I think, seven kids in our class that went to Yale, which is pretty remarkable for a class of a little over 300 people. I can see Debbie saying, how could that be? Well, we found out, actually, there was a guy from Garden City that was in the admissions department, and I later learned. <laughs> but they, all of these were great students and athletes and uh, scholars, etc. Uh, it really was. But it does reflect, I think, looking back on those days 50 years ago, even uh, in a, a suburb of New York City, it reflects the reality of our country and God's world. All through history, race and social class has shaped people's lives to whatever extent, um, sometimes greatly, sometimes just not so greatly, but, um, but I think in a large portion it shaped our whole history. Uh, Labor Day, is the day to remember that the working class uh, came together. These are folks that a lot of them were immigrants. Um, a lot of them uh, had no uh, great formal education, and uh, as the Industrial Revolution came about, they were working in factories, and they weren't treated very well. So they came together and risked, in some cases, their very lives, um, and made sacrifices, and won for us a lot of good things for all of us. They won weekends off. Um, they won holidays off. Uh, they won sick leave. And they won health care plans for employees. They won vacations. And they won retirement plans that you could put money in and get some money out when you got through. And they 
earned a voice at the table of the place they worked at. It was a union movement, and I think sometimes uh, we downgrade unions. You know, uh, they've had corruption. Sure they have. Every human institution has had corruptions. I mean, those of us that are old enough remember the, um, especially Bobby Kennedy going after Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, there was corruption in some of these unions. But when they started, they were pretty pure, and they were pretty dedicated, and they were pretty brave. Henry Ford um, uh, was making cars and making a lot of money, and his workers tried to unionize. You know what he did? His response to that was hiring a private army to try to discourage, in a very physical way, the forming of a union. Uh, fortunately, eventually, there was a union at Ford, and unions have done a lot of good for us. Well, it seems to me we, we talk about Labor Day and we think of strife, but I think it's part of a, 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 an effort for justice, a, an effort for compassion, is part of the concept that's a great Jewish and tradition, uh, Christian tradition that runs uh, through our faith, and we don't talk enough about it. The word is hospitality. Hospitality. Um, I think about this because I got a newsletter um, in the mail uh, from a Catholic worker friend of mine. His name is Jim Douglas. He and his wife Shelley for years have run a, uh, uh, an organization called Mary's House, which is a Catholic worker house uh, down in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Shelley's done most of the running of it. Jim's busy writing books. He wrote uh, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, which um, you can find in the library, uh, about the Kennedy assassination. And he's, he's now working on a, a book on the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. But um, a, a wonderful guy, and I've gotten to know him just from interviewing him on the radio, and we talk every once in a while now. But the Catholic workers are in the tradition of Dorothy Day, who started these kinds of houses all over the country. Now, when they look at today's scripture, they can be a little dark, uh, especially that Jesus parable. But let's start with Amos. Uh, he wasn't there to condemn people. He was there to get them back on the right track, get them say that it's great to have a festival, the choir is very good, but we need to get back, first of all and foremost of all, to doing God's work, which is not taking advantage of poor people. In those days, the 8th century, um, the rich people had really a large portion of any revenue that was available, and the poor people often became slaves to the rich people because they couldn't make it, uh, so they had to just become these people's slaves. Uh, they, they, they would loan them money at exorbitant interest rates, and God said to Moses, would you go straighten these people out, tell them to shut down the organ for a while or the piano, and tell the choir to ease off and let's, let's first do the right thing. And that's what that, uh, it seems to me, is about. It's about trying to change uh, the context in which they found themselves, with the poor being taken advantage of by the rich. Then there's Jesus' parable, which can be very dark. Um, it sounds like uh, 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 Lazarus, who was treated very badly uh, by this rich fellow, um, uh, and uh, he ends up in heaven as a reward, and the rich fellow uh, down with Dante uh, getting his feet dried off uh, down in hell. And um, the rich guy is very thirsty, and he wants, wants God to get him some water. If God doesn't do it, maybe he could send Lazarus down to give him water. Well, it's not really a story about punishment. I don't think God burns anybody in hell. I might learn differently from Dante. I don't know. But I do believe... Uh, that the story is meant to show the responsibility we all have as human beings, uh, and especially those of us that are better off than others, to practice hospitality to those in need. Hospitality, which includes uh, justice, but it also includes compassion, and it includes a sense of fairness uh, to everyone, and personal commitment to reaching out to people. I've always been very proud of this congregation. It's, it's a wonderful group, um, and I think we try to do that. That's part of our mission. Um, you know, the wonderful support 
by the whole village here, for the Levine family, which continues um, to experience how to get money from the insurance company to find a place to live, and the, the, their struggles go on, but they're very grateful for the help we've given them and the whole town has given them. Um, the food pantry, which no longer uh, exists, but it does. I mean, I got a call this week from a lady who uh, had used the food pantry just on occasion. She's a school bus driver. Uh, we've helped her family for years. She makes a living and she rarely calls, but she called the other day because the school buses hadn't started running yet and she hadn't been paid all summer. Uh, but the session had authorized us to get some uh, certificates for market basket and so I was able to give her a, a card for groceries and uh, she's able to feed her family until the buses started rolling uh, later on in the week. Um, we'll always feed the hungry. Uh, the Helping Hand Fund is still very much in evidence, and if people need help with a bill that they just can't pay, and that happens to a lot of people these days, and especially with the price of gas and the price of electric going up, we help them. Thanksgiving um, and Christmas, we help those in need, and we'll try to continue to do that. Um, Labor Day, it seems to me, reminds us that all of us are in this together and that we can come together uh, to practice hospitality, which includes uh, compassion and justice, and which is both personal, uh, can be personal, and as a part of Jesus' worldwide community. So let me um, read you a little definition from Jim and Shelley's newsletter of hospitality. This is from a book called House of Hospitality, written by John Cogley. Here's his comments on hospitality. Hospitality is derived from the Latin word for guest. It is bound by the rules of courtesy and union companionship and ruled by the law of charity. There are always men and women who need hospitality for one reason or another. There are, in an imperfect world of imperfect men and women, always those who need a calling back to life, a restoration of personality. There are always those lonely people in all times, in all places, who need the knowledge of being respected as men and women, and I might add to that as boys and girls in school too, of living with other men and women and boys and girls with dignity or sharing their own burdens with others and bearing some of the burdens for others. Hospitality reminds people that they are brothers and sisters, children of God, dependent on others, and capable of being dependent on by others. It is not a specialized work requiring scientific training. It is something for everyone to practice according to the measure that they are able to do so. Hospitality can be practiced by everyone in the home, the church, the social club, the school, it has a thousand forms and can be practiced in a thousand different ways. The charm of hospitality, because it is peculiarly human, appeals to all. And it is not surprising that often God should use the hospitality people give each other as an instrument of God's grace. And then there's another word for this, which I just happened to think of as I was talking here, karma. And um, I'll give you a little story. Uh, Borby and I went over to the International House of Pancakes um, uh, some, someone, uh, uh, the other day for breakfast. And they were short of help, like many places are. This is the one over in Bedford. And um, so we were there, and um, there was a lady sitting next to us just by herself. And as she got up, I think she had a crutch or something, but it was, it was a little awkward getting up, and she knock the sugar um, packets that were on the table onto the floor. So I, I wouldn't do anything special. I just got up and, you know, picked them all up and put them back so she wouldn't have to do that. And um, she thanked us and went on. And uh, we came to pay the bill. The waitress said, oh, you don't have to pay the bill. The lady over here at this other table had paid our bill because I thought we did a big thing by picking up the sugar packets. So the result of that was 
Partly because there was no cashier to break my $20 bill, but I left the $20 for the waitress. So everybody did well. <laughs> Kindness and reciprocity um, and good karma spreads. And when we practice hospitality, it's a way to both help Lazarus, Lazarus uh, when he's living here and now, especially help the downtrodden and see that they have enough cold water to drink and place to stay and a, a chance to live life as fully as they can because we take time to spend with them. I think that's what God calls us to do. So let us prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is another uh, event of hospitality. And uh, let us do so as we sing our second hymn, which is number 393. I'm honored to extend God's hospitality to you all. God invites us all to partake in his meal. Uh, it is not the Presbyterian church table that we gather around or the community church table. It is the Lord's table and all are invited to partake. And let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, you are a God who is peaceful, a God who is comforting, a God who is loving, but also a God who calls us to care about one another as you care about each one of us. We thank you for coming into the world in a very special way, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, to forgive us, to inspire us, to give us hope, and to love us. And we pray for your presence here. We are grateful that you accept in these moments our silent prayers of confession. Our Father, we do know in our hearts that there are times we have done things we should not have done, and other times we have left undone things that you would have had us do. We are grateful that you are a forgiving God who stands us back up and says, try again. Be with us, we ask, as we celebrate this meal. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Scriptures tell us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his disciples, and after sharing a Passover meal together, he took bread and blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, 
I said, this cup represents my blood, which is about to be shed for all of you. Drink this in remembrance of me. And as we prepare, if you have not been with us before, when you've had communion, you will find both um, bread and gluten-free crackers uh, on the tray. And also then on the wine trays, you'll find both grape juice and wine. And take whatever is appropriate for you. So let us share together in the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
This cup represents the blood of Jesus of Nazareth shed for all of us and for the world. Let us continue to worship as we share our morning gifts. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing upon these, our gifts, and upon us. Help us to be your servants in a world in need. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Greater is he that is in me. closing hymn, which is number 408.
May the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us and grant us peace, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beautiful words, one.